Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy and welcome to my neck of the woods. You know, when I first got into the flat earth community, I was a reasonably intelligent, scientifically literate man who was faced with 10 or 12 very well polished yet nonsensical arguments supporting the flat earth. Now, sometimes we run into a little problem. We all know that the earth is rotating, but how do you exactly scientifically prove that? I knew about sunrise and sunset, but I learned about Foucault pendulums and I learned about mechanical gyroscopes, the pattern of shadows, centrifugal force and weight differentials, etc. It was a really nice journey learning all of these things, but I got to thinking, wouldn't it be nice if we had one series out there that took apart each of these standard flat earth arguments and gave us a basis for our response? So what I did was I put together a rather exciting panel. Let me introduce them to you. Well, first, let me introduce you to Charlie H. He's not very well known, but he brings with him a wealth of experience to this series. He is a physics major who builds telescopes, both for the professionals and for amateurs. Projects that he's worked on include the Giant Magellan Telescope down in Chile. The interesting thing about Charlie is that he lived and worked in Antarctica for well over a year, both at the McMurdo Station and at the South Pole, doing solar observations. So he's going to talk a little bit about that. Next, we have Harry from Tennessee. He's an electrical engineer, and you know him as Blue Marble Science. He's got a very nice way of explaining things in simple terms that really make a lot of sense. And he's somebody I've worked with on a number of different experiments. Now, we're going to be joined by one more expert later on in the series, and I'll introduce him when he comes in. And finally, we have Rob, a commercial pilot, amateur astronomer, and all-around polymath. He was the inspiration for my channel and the style and content that you see on this channel. So let's cue up the music and get started with our friend Wolfie6020. Good morning, Bob. Uh, it's going on 10.30 p.m. here for me in Perth, Australia, but uh, good to talk to you and uh, thanks for having me on your show. Well, thank you for taking the time to go ahead and do this. I don't think you've had a chance to do this with anybody before, have you? No, not really. Not really. I've done a, uh, a voice-only interview with Critical Think, but I've never done a video one before. That's kind of cool. You know, for a long time, we never saw your face, and I guess this is the first time we've ever seen you in motion live. I'll, I'll tell you a little secret, Bob, and uh, I've got a, a video that's on my computer now. I first came across Flat Earth when I was in Rio in 2016 for the Olympics. And the very first video that I made shows my full name, shows a picture of my face. I posted a link to it on Eric DeBay's channel and it was actually deleted straight away. So people could have known exactly what I looked like straight away. Then people try and make a game out of doxing you, it seems. Yeah. But in any event, you know, I got into Flat Earth based on the influence of two people. One was Sir Sick, who just kind of introduced me to the idea that people actually believed in Flat Earth. And then the other one, of course, was you. You were one of my early inspirations and one of my early backers. You got me my first 100 subs with a little shout out on your channel. Oh, now, boy, here boy, we are boy. 400 videos later and almost 20,000. So but it started with you, man. Yeah. The very first subject that I did a video on was pilots having to dip their nose. And I, I'm a pilot. I don't have to dip my nose and I know why. So I made a quick 10 minute video with my iPhone on the dining room table. Mm -hmm. Well, here you go. And here's my expertise, but I'm glad I got that settled for you. Mm -hmm. Then the fight began. In the Flat Earth, there really aren't any original arguments. And one of the things that I wanted to do was kind of go over their top 10 list and show how to properly counter them. Sure. There are a lot of very scientifically literate and smart people out there that never really gave any thought to, well, what is the proof the Earth rotates? And why did they phrase that question in that certain way? You know, why did they say gas pressure and not atmospheric pressure? Mm -hmm. So let's go over a few of them. The first one is one of my personal favorites. 
Gravity's not a force. What are your thoughts on that, Wolfie? Well, my, my standard argument with um, the flat earthers when they talk about gravity is just keeping it as simple as possible. They, they tend to overcomplicate it, but there's one thing that we cannot deny, and that is if we jump, we fall back down. If we throw an object into the air, it falls back down. Okay, something is causing it to do that. And if they want to call it gravity or something else, it, it doesn't really matter because we cannot refute the fact that objects will fall towards the ground. Um, it's irrefutable. There's, you can throw water in the air, you can throw uh, a ball, it's just going to fall down. So there is something there that um, is pulling things down towards the ground. That, that aspect is irrefutable. Being um, precise about what it actually is doesn't really matter for most of the arguments on that case. You know, when we start to look at atmospheric pressure later on in the, the discussion, it doesn't matter what is causing those air molecules to be pulled towards the surface, but we can irrefutably prove that something is doing that. So I sort of don't get tied up in their word games. You know, I try to keep it as very simple as possible. And when a flat earther starts telling me to prove gravity, I'll throw straight back at them. I said, tell me what happens when you jump up or tell me what happens when you throw a ball in the air. And then we take it from there because they cannot refute the fact that it falls back down to the ground. Well, the problem that you run into is that, yes, you can't refute the fact that you fall back to the ground if you jump or hop off a ledge or something or other like that. But they'll always come up with different reasons for that. Mm -hmm. They generally tend to approach it two different ways. And the first way is they try to play definition games. Well, do you mean Einsteinian gravity or Newtonian gravity? Yeah, I don't get Gravity is gravity, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Einstein and Newton just developed models to try and explain what it did. It doesn't change the fact that there's an overall thing called gravity, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Do you fly airplanes based on space time or do you use Newtonian physics? <laughs> uh, it's basically Newtonian, isn't it? It's just force and uh, lift, thrust, weight and drag. You know, they're the Newtonian forces, acceleration, we have um, thrust from the engines overcoming the drag, that is uh, a factor of the, the parasite drag of the fuselage and the induced drag produced by the wing. So yeah, we're, we're just looking at the basic forces there. So Newtonian physics works perfectly well in our world. Absolutely. And Einstein's equations would only come into play to increase the accuracy in special circumstances. That's why they call it special relativity. Speed's close to those of light. Does your yeah, plane sure. go anywhere near light speed? It's a pretty fast corporate jet, but not even close to the speed of light. We don't fly over a massive black hole and we're not a tiny subatomic particle. So in our world, Newtonian yeah. physics is good enough, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think the, uh, that's the, certainly the current way of looking at it from the point of view of Einstein. Um, even w as far as Einstein is concerned, gravity does manifest itself as a force once uh, an object is no longer allowed to move uh, along its preferred geodesic. So if you're not falling through the air and are in contact with the Earth, even according to Einstein, I believe that you would be essentially um, experiencing a force between you and the ground. So as far as normal people's use of the term, they experience a force because when they get on a scale, they weigh something. When they pick something up, they weigh it weighs something. When they hang a fish on a spring scale, there's a weight there. And those and all of those weights are forces. Now from the point of view of physics, of course, a force is something that happens when you try to accelerate a mass. But it's, you know, to say that gravity is not a force is, that's just an attempt to, like, deflect. You know, when Newton described that, uh, he described it as a force in, in three-dimensional space. Uh, and that's exactly what gravity presents itself as. It is, uh, it is, it is. It does present itself as a force in three-dimensional space. Uh, 
frankly, you know, when we're dealing with gravity here on, on earth, uh, I really rather think of it as an acceleration rather than a force. Acceleration gives rise to a force if it's being applied to a mass, obviously. Um, but at the end of the day, you, you go over to, uh, to the work of Einstein and now you're in four dimensions and now space time is curving and you do have an acceleration present. But I think the, the main thing to keep in mind is regardless of which one you're talking about, they both end up saying the same thing. Um, now, what do you mean by that? You stay, well, as long as you, as, as long as mass, uh, as long as the mass we're talking about is relatively small, I mean, something quite a bit smaller than a, a say a black hole. Uh, and as long as things aren't moving too quickly, like, you know, close to the speed of light, uh, you reach the, uh, the weak field limits of the Einstein uh, field equations. And what happens is Newton's equation falls right out of it. So they say exactly the same thing and, they, and you will get exactly the same answer. And even Einstein recognized that, uh, uh, quite prominently in a letter he wrote to the uh, London Times in 1919. You know, I'm just curious about something, Harry. If mm -hmm. Einstein were to take a rock and drop it, and if he mm -hmm. wanted to figure out how long it took that rock to hit the ground, would he use tensor calculus to do that, or would he use Newton's equations? If he had a brain in his head, he would use Newton's equations. And that's, yeah. he considers yeah. Newton's equations good enough for things like that. It's only when we're dealing with things like the precession of mercury, which changes by something like 43 or 44 arc seconds per century between Newton yeah. and Einstein. Einstein's just a little bit more accurate. It's more of a refinement. Yeah. But exactly. in reality, they both talk about the same thing, and that's gravity, isn't it? Yeah. They're just models of how it works or what its effect is. It's not defining what gravity itself is. It just says basically how it works and does so pretty accurately. Absolutely. What do you think about an argument that I make many times? The flat earth has got ulterior motives for denying the existence of gravity. The reason being is that any large object, you know, several hundred miles across, for example, mm -hmm. due to gravitational factors, would collapse into a sphere. Yes. So you cannot have gravity and a flat Earth. I understand, yes, I agree with All you. All right, you know, you talked about bear traps. Is this a bear trap that they try and lay for us? It is, you know, there's one person in particular who has been harping on this forever and that's Sleeping Warrior. Uh, he seems to have been the one leading the charge on the Mr. Uh, this is an egg, that guy? Yeah, 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 this, you're right, that guy. Um, he seems to be the guy who's been most interested in, in pounding and pounding and pounding on the, on the idea that gravity is not a force. Well, I think the biggest bear trap that we deal with with this gravity is not a force thing is that there's a strategy behind it. Now, Sleeping Warrior and Quantum Eraser and these other flat earth scholars, I guess you'd call them, think out their arguments in advance, and they do it to promote their narrative. Now, their narrative is the Earth is flat. If gravity exists, a, any large object will collapse into a sphere due to gravitational forces. There's no way around it. A disk or a fl large flat plane cannot exist. It would collapse into a sphere. So... That's right. What they do is they sit down and say, well, Einstein, quote unquote, superseded Newton. Now, superseded means replaced or invalidated in their mind. So therefore, we can no longer look at Newton. And since Einstein's gravity is based on math, and math, of course, as we know, isn't real. Therefore, Einstein's gravity is invalid. So Newton's been invalidated. Given the fact that Einstein's just math, that's not valid. Therefore, no gravity. Does that pretty yeah, much sum it up? It does. I think that's the direction that they try to take it. And what's wrong uh, with that? 
other well, than the fact that Newton's gravity works very well for building bridges today and has worked well for centuries, it's still always, valid, is it not? It, it always has been valid. It's still valid. We, we, we use it on a daily basis. Uh, and Einstein acknowledged the validity of Newton's oh, theories yeah, totally. and equations totally. especially. Einstein said in his own words that his theory nor any other theory could ever supersede the work of Newton. Did he actually that, say supersede? Never supersede? He, he said it could, <laughs> his work can never really supersede the great work of, of Newton. Oh, that, that, I mean, that's exactly what, what uh, Einstein said. Yet all the flat earthers now like to use the term supersede. What is yeah. it that we should look out for when we're arguing with a flat earther? about gravity besides monitor and facial damage <laughs> that's probably the two main things all right uh, what i what i really like doing with those guys is just refusing to discuss einstein why do you need to talk about einstein there's no point in it are we going uh, close to the speed of light and are we a black hole no that's well, right einstein we're, we're, doesn't we're, really I'm not. I'm not personally in my day-to-day -day life concerned about the precession of the uh, orbit of Mercury or any other planet. So it, you know, none of that makes any difference to me. Uh, there is absolutely no reason to do anything other than discuss Newtonian physics, and what Newton said works just fine. Well, there we had a brief discussion of Is Gravity a Force by Wolfie6020, Charlie, and Blue Marble Science. Let me add my little two cents to it. One of the big distinctions seems to be the difference between Newtonian gravity and Einsteinian gravity. Let me see if I can clear that up with a little analogy. Say you're driving down the road minding your own business. Your speed is steady. You're staying in your lane. Things are good with the world. Up ahead, you see a group of deer grazing in the shoulder off to the side of the road. What do you do? Well, this is a pretty common experience that we have here in Michigan, and what we do is we kind of move over to the opposite lane to give them a little bit of space in case they decide to do something stupid, and we don't really want to startle them too much, but it isn't anything that's going to interfere with our trip down the road. Now, when we pass the deer, we go back into our original lane. If you look at this situation from a Newtonian aspect, the deer caused us to go to the other lane. And there's a lot of argument for that. We can be perfectly happy understanding it in that way. And then once we were past the deer, we went back into our original lane. Now with Einstein, the presence of the deer caused us to move into the other lane. You see the slight distinction? Now, in reality, we control the vehicle and we moved over into the other lane because the deer were there. They didn't do anything to physically move us. But even looking at it both ways, the end result was the same. We were in our lane. We moved to the opposite lane. We returned to our lane when we passed the deer. The effect is no different either way. Now, in our next episode, we're going to discuss the term level and water finds its level. So I hope you'll hit that little like and subscribe button down there and join me for the rest of this series, which will go on for several weeks. In the meantime, this is Bob the Science Guy, signing out from Northern Michigan. Thank you very much for stopping by, and take care. See you soon.